um, a word about Anastasia Baburova, who was born in the Ukraine in 1983 uh, and studied journalism in Moscow. She became concerned with human rights questions with the war in Chechnya. Uh, she worked with the one um, oppositional newspaper in Moscow, Novaya Gazeta. Um, a couple of years ago, she visited Sweden for the European Social Forum, and, and then a year ago, at age 25, she was uh, protesting the very light sentence that a Russian colonel had got after raping and murdering a Chechen woman. Uh, and after the protest uh, on the street in Moscow a year ago, Anastasia was murdered by her political opponents, and I want to dedicate our short discussion to her memory. At the same newspaper was Anna Politkovskaya, the um, well-known journalist who wrote about the war in Chechnya, uh, who wrote about human rights questions, about abuses of power in, in the Kremlin, who survived uh, an assassination attempt. Uh, and at that point, many of her friends said, uh, it's, it's time to leave Russia. You could become a guest professor at uh, Yale or Berkeley or Oxford and, and have a nice, safe life outside of this country. And she said, no, um, the, the job of the, the doctor is to give health to her patients. The job of the journalist is to write what she sees is, is the reality and that she was going to keep doing that. And Anna Politkovskaya, as some of you remember, was murdered in 2006. And I also want to remember her. It's, it's almost uh, absurd that someone as uh, timid and cautious as I would have the privilege of lecturing about people like Anastasia and Anna uh, at Harvard and at universities in Sweden. Uh, and it happened because of my, my own students. Uh, at Harvard in the spring of 2001, uh, 50 of them took over the Harvard rector's office, the Harvard president's office, and declared that they would stay there until the people who clean the floors of Harvard and uh, mop up the spills in the laboratories and cook the food were paid an adequate wage. Uh, the situation was that, that, that Harvard, the world's richest university by far, um, th these individuals were, were paid so little that many of them, a, a number of them, slept in homeless shelters at night. And these students um, stayed in the president's office for three weeks until the university agreed to, to pay a living wage. During that time, there were some students who felt that they learned more by that building takeover uh, than they were learning in the rest of their Harvard educations. Uh, and some of them asked me to create a course to uh, take up questions of civic courage, civic courage that the, the former Archbishop of Sweden, Koge Hammer, uh, defines as a readiness to take risks uh, to protect or help people uh, outside one's own family and circle of friends or to defend a common ideal. Uh, and I, I said I would be glad to, to design such a course. Uh, and I, I came up with a title that was sufficiently grandiose for Harvard and for my own ego, uh, Personal Choice and Global Transformation, the course was to be called. And it, it was to begin uh, on the 12th of September, 2001. Some of you re may remember September 11th of that year with the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Uh, and as the writer Rebecca Solnit has, has written in a, in, a, in a new book, A Paradise Built in Hell, it's often in times of catastrophe that people's idealistic and altruistic feelings are greatest. And at just that moment, there were many students uh, in the wake of the terror attacks who felt that, of course, on engagement was just what they needed. So many that I needed to switch classrooms four times until we were in an auditorium big enough for all 300 who wanted to take the course. Friends say that my ego has never recovered from that week, <laughs> and they're right. Um, 
<clears throat> the next time I gave the course, there were more than 600 students and um, at Harvard with an average course size of 11. That was news. Uh, Boston Magazine wrote of the course, comparing it to the, the one larger course, the required course in economics. Uh, I quote, if Harvard's most popular course, Economics 10, uh, prepares econ majors to become employee-axing, environment-wrecking chief executives, uh, its second most popular course and largest elective goes the other way, leading its students toward St. Francis-style sainthood. <laughs> the course, the magazine continued, is, quote, Taught by the slim, wispy-voiced, and vaguely monkish Brian Palmer. <laughs> and I thought to myself, how did they find out? I began the course with a quotation from the French philosopher Voltaire. Voltaire, who was at home in Paris on the 1st of November, 1755, when a terrible earthquake struck Lisbon in Portugal. Uh, leveling much of the city, leading to terrible fires, an earthquake as, as, as damaging as that in Port-au-Prince this year. And Voltaire was struck by how when the news of that reached Paris, uh, it was hard for people to take it in, to feel empathy, to, to really care about others' suffering. Uh, and he wrote, Lisbon lies in ruins, and here in Paris we dance. And that was a feeling that my students and I often had. Fallujah in Iraq lies in ruins, and here in Harvard Square we dance, or here in Stockholm. Someone who reflected on uh, Voltaire's words uh, was the late writer Susan Sontag, who felt that Voltaire expresses a frustration that many of us feel uh, when faced with what she calls the simultaneity of wildly contrasting human fates. How is it that at the same time we are here well and, and comfortable, perhaps I'm a little more comfortable than you are, but uh, in, in, in a, in a well-organized city uh, that there are, are people uh, in Gaza, in Darfur, in the South Bronx, uh, in uh, in uh, Chechnya, uh, in in situations of 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 extreme suffering, uh, how how can that happen at the same minute? To to ponder that question and to think about how we live in a world of others suffering, we, my students and I, invite in various guests to the, guests to the courses, uh, to ask them about their their own responses. One of our guests, for example, was Amy Goodman, a journalist. Our guests are, are everyone from uh, people who work in university dining halls to poets, soldiers, chief executives of companies. Amy Goodman, uh, who was in Stockholm for the Right Livelihood Award a year and a half ago to, to receive it, uh, got a question from a student about a time uh, 15 years ago when she was in East Timor during Indonesia, Indonesia's occupation of, of that land, uh, and she witnessed a peaceful protest. People had written on bed sheets, uh, why did the Indonesian military shoot into our church? Why did they kill my sister? Why did they flatten our village? And Amy Goodman saw that there was a large contingent of Indonesian soldiers coming with their weapons toward the protesters instead of, of fleeing for her own safety, uh, she decided to try to be as visible as possible. Uh, she stood in front of the protesters and held up her microphone in the air like a flag, hoping that um, the soldiers would not open fire if they saw a white Western journalist on the scene. But they opened fire and killed more than 200 people in front of her eyes before attacking her and during the attack, her American passport fell out of her pocket. A soldier picked it up and, and looked at it, and, uh, and they, 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 they left her in the dirt and, and went away. She said she figured they didn't want to kill someone from the same country that had purchased their weapons for them. And afterwards, uh, um, 
students had more questions. Why does she take such risks when she could stay home in uh, Manhattan with a nice life as a famous journalist? And then when the hour was over, there were many students who wanted to talk more with Amy Goodman, who came to the front of the auditorium and who had different versions of the same question, where do I sign up? Can I go with you the next time you're doing such a rep reportage? What should I be studying here at university if I want to learn to become so bold and strong a woman as you are? And at that moment, I had the feeling that courage can be almost as contagious as fear. We know that fear is contagious in a panic situation when someone yells fire in a crowded theater, but that, that courage also can spread between people. And um, we take up different, different forms of courage uh, in, the, in the courses, and sometimes it's not always possible to interview the people we'd like to. Uh, whistleblowers, for example, uh, those who go public about something unethical in an organization uh, to, to, to try to stop some wrongdoing, such as Karen Silkwood working in a nuclear power plant in Oklahoma in the United States, discovered that the, the owners of the plant were faking information about the safety of, of their product. Uh, she got an appointment with a journalist from the New York Times and, 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 and going out to, to meet him at the airport, she was murdered and her documents taken from her. Um, or Joe Darby, there's often a stereotype of whistleblowers that they're born rebels, troublemakers, people who want to ruin their organization's reputation. It turns out it's, it's, it's usually almost the reverse. Whistleblowers tend to be people who are very loyal uh, to the organization they work for and then feel so heartbroken when they see that uh, people are not living up to the values of that organization. Joe Darby joined the United States Army because he felt that my country's army was doing such good around the world for democracy and human rights. He was especially proud to serve in Iraq and toppling a dictator. And then one day he was copying some music from another soldier. Uh, he saw on the same CD there were some pictures. Uh, he got curious and started uh, looking at them, and he saw that they were pictures of torture, uh, pictures of American soldiers systematically torturing Iraqi civilians in Abu Ghraib. He took three weeks to ponder what he should do with this terrible contradiction this army that he loved, that he thought was there for human rights, um, there in Iraq to support human rights, was engaged in, in torture uh, until he, he decided the world has to know about this. Uh, and that's how, 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 how we know about it. We think also about people who use their time in the media spotlight in an effective way. Uh, the artist Andy Warhol said we would all be famous for 15 minutes. Uh, someone who used his 15 minutes of, thought about how to use his 15 minutes of fame uh, was the sprinter Tommy Smith uh, in the 1968 Olympic Games, uh, the 200 meter, uh, and he thought if he wins, he wants to do something for the civil rights movement against racism. Uh, the race was won, he came in first, and. Uh, going to the, the locker room, he told the other two, yeah, when we're up there on the winner podium, as soon as they start playing the American national song, I'm going to raise my fist in the black power salute, and I'm going to keep it up there till the song is finished. Another of the winners, also African American, joined him in that protest. They knew that they would pay a price for it. They didn't know how high. Already that day, the Olympic Committee wanted their medals back. Uh, they were blacklisted, barred from future competitions, harassed, threatened. Uh, the, the other winner, John Carlos, uh, his wife, uh, some years later, killed herself under all of the pressures. Tommy Smith was asked 30 years later, was it worth it for you, those five minutes? 
He said, was it worth it? Of course it was worth it. This was my one chance to really push my country's history in a different direction, and I didn't miss my chance. But you don't have to be a world famous athlete to not miss your chance to affect change. I think of two 11-year-old girls, twins, Ellen and Jana Hansen, in Eskilstuna, Sweden, beginning of December 2008. Their music teacher said, in a few days, our class will be doing the traditional Swedish Lucia procession with music for a local company here in Eskilstuna, Bofors. And Ellen and Jana said to the music teacher, wait a minute, Bofors, isn't that the company that makes weapons? And the music teacher said, yeah, that's right. And um, they said, no, well, we don't really want to do this. And the teacher said, well, it's something we all do. It's not a choice situation. Uh, they said, no, no, we, we don't feel right about singing for a weapons company. And uh, the class representative was even more um, upset um, uh, at, their, at their defiance, uh, because it was Beaufort that pays for the school trip each year. Um, but uh, Ellen and Jana said, no, we're, we're not going to sing the Lucia songs for a weapons company. Uh, and they got detention uh, sitting in the, uh, alone in the classroom as a punishment. Um, but, but many adults began to think, if two 11-year-olds are ready to do that, then, then, then maybe we who are a little older can also do something. We think too of those like uh, Rachel Corey, who ventured to uh, another part of the world to try to lend their energy and skills to people in a situation of war or extreme poverty. Rachel Corey, who was a nonviolent witness uh, in the occupied territories of Palestine to try to minimize the violence when she was killed by an Israeli soldier. And finally, um, Wesley Outry, uh, an African-American construction worker in New York City, uh, in um, January of 2007, he was going into the subway with his two young daughters uh, pictured here, uh, and he saw a, a man fall down on the subway platform further down. Uh, and the man fell, had an epileptic seizure, uh, fell further down onto the tracks. Wesley Outry ran down, uh, tr uh, hopped down on the tracks, tried to lift up the epileptic man. Uh, he saw that the train was coming into the station, uh, <clears throat> the Lexington Avenue Express, and he wouldn't have time to lift up this other man and himself onto the platform before they'd both be run over. So he decided to push the epileptic man down in the space between the two metal rails. And he pushed his own body tightly on top to stop the epileptic man's spastic flailing. The train driver hit the brakes as hard as he could but four wagons of the train had time to roll over these two men before it came to a complete stop. And then Wesley Outry, Wesley Outry yelled up to his daughters and the others on the platform from under the train that he was still alive, that they shouldn't be afraid. And after an hour, the rescue workers could take them up and they had only minor injuries. There were many of us who asked ourselves whether we would have been ready to do the same thing uh, and imagined we probably wouldn't have, but it's hard to know without being in, in, in a similar situation. Uh, and there was a, a wave of, of, of joy in New York. I was there at the time um, as, as people felt that, that Wesley Outry was showing a kind of courage, a kind of behavior that that many of us wanted to see in ourselves uh, and, and in, in, in others around us. An artist uh, made an, an image of the uh, train coming into the station, the two daughters on the platform, the epileptic man, and Wesley Outry in the form of a guardian angel 
uh, lifting up or more properly put, pushing down the epileptic man. And there were many people who felt that Wesley Autry is someone who understands that, that life is a gift. It's not something we have in, for all eternity and, and that he was ready to pass on that gift to someone else if he happened to be the most available person to help in somebody else's emergency. Thank you.